Hello and greetings to all my people in the shorebound. <laughs> I'd like to thank you for tuning in to my channel. I'm Torin, and I'll be reading to you today from The Will of Time by Jordan. We will read from book one, The Eye of the World. We will also be reading chapter one, An Empty Road. So what I would like you to do is if you enjoy it, please give me a like, please share it, and please, if you really enjoy it and want to see more, subscribe with the notification bell on, if you wouldn't mind. Now, the other thing I need you to do is I really want some feedback. I, um, I don't know how well I'm doing with this. I've just recently started this channel. Um, this particular chapter is completely iconic. This is the chapter that begins the journey that is the will of time. So what I would like for you to do is please correct me on my pronunciations. Please give me feedback on uh, my reading, the characters, the sound quality, everything so that I can fix everything is on the channel so that you guys can enjoy it more. I want to thank you and um, let us begin. Chapter One, An Empty Road. The wheel of time turns and ages come to pass, leaving memories that become legend. Legend fades to myth, and even myth is long forgotten when the age it gave it birth comes again. In one age, called the third age by some, an age yet to come, an age long past, a wind rose in the mountains of mist. The wind was not the beginning. There are neither beginnings nor endings to the turning of the wheel of time, but it was a beginning. Born below the ever cloud capped peaks that gave the mountains their name, the wind blew east, out across the sand hills, once the shore of a great ocean, before the breaking of the world. And down it flailed into the two rivers, into the tangled forest called the Westwood, and beat it two men walking with a cart and horse down the rock strewn track called the Quarry Road. For all that spring should have come a good month since, the wind carried an icy chill, and it would rather bear snow. Gus splashed it, ran out Thor's cloak to his back, whipped the earth colored wool around his legs then streamed it out behind him. He wished his coat were heavier, or that he had worn an extra shirt. Half the time, when he tried to tug the cloak back around him, it caught on the quiver swinging at his hip. Trying to hold the cloak one-handed did not do much good anyway. He had his bow in the other, an arrow knocked and ready to draw. As a particularly strong blast tugged the cloak out of his hand, he glanced at his father over the back of the shaggy brown mare. He felt a little foolish about wanting to reassure himself that Tam was there. But it was that kind of day. The wind howled when it rose. But aside from that, quiet lay heavy on the land. The soft creak of the axle sounded loud by comparison. No birds sang in the forest. No squirrels chittered from a branch. Not that he expected them, really. Not this spring. Only trees that kept leaf or needle through the winter had any green about them. Snarls of last year's bramble spread brown webs over stone outcrops under the trees. Nettles numbered most among the few weeds. The rest were the source with sharp burrs and thorns, or stinkweed, which left a rank smell on the young weary boot that crushed it. Scattered white patches of snow still dotted the ground, where Tight clumps of trees kept deep shade. Where sunlight did reach, it held neither strength nor warmth. The pale sun set above the trees to the east, but its light was crisply dark as if mixed with shadow. It was an awkward morning, made for unpleasant thoughts. Without thinking, he touched the knock of the arrow. It was ready to draw to his cheek in one smooth movement, the way Tam had taught him. The winter had been bad enough on the farms, worse than even the oldest folk remembered. But it must have been harsher still in the mountains, if the number of wolves driven down into the two rivers was any guide. 
wolves raided the sheep pen and chewed their way into barns to get the cattle and horses. Bears had been after the sheep too, where a bear had not been seen in years. It was no longer safe to be out after dark. Men were the prey as often as sheep, and the sun did not always have to be down. Tam was taking steady strides on the other side of Bella, using his spear as a walking staff, ignoring the wind that made his brown cloak flap like a banner. Now and again, he touched the mare's flank lightly to remind her to keep moving. With his thick chest and broad face, he was a pillar of reality in that morning, like a stone in the middle of a drifting dream. His sun roughened cheeks might be lined in his hair, only have a sprinkling of black among the gray, but there was a solidness to him, as though a flood could wash around him without uprooting his feet. He stumped down the road now impassively. Wolves and bears were all very well, his manner said. Things that any man who kept sheep must be aware of, but they had best not to try Tam Al Thor getting to Eamon's field. With a guilty start, Rand returned to watching his side of the road. Tam's matter-of-factness reminded him of his task. He was a head taller than his father, taller than anyone else in the district, and had a little of Tam in him physically except, perhaps for a breadth of shoulder. Gray eyes and reddish tint to his hair came from his mother, so Tam said. She had been an outlander, and Rand remembered little of her aside from a smiling face, though he did put flowers on her grave every year at bell time in the spring, and it's Sunday, in the summer. Two small casks of Tam's apple brandy rested in the lurching cart, and eight larger barrels of apple cider, only slightly hard after a winter's curing. Tam delivered the same every year to the wine spring inn for use during bell time, and he had declared that it would take more than wolves or cold wind to stop him this spring. Even so, they had not been to the village for weeks, not even Tam traveled much these days, but Tam had given his word about the brandy and cider, even if he had waited to make delivery until the day before festival. Keeping his word was important to Tam. Rand was just glad to get away from the farm, almost as glad as about the coming of bell time. As Rand watched the side of the road, the feeling grew in him that he was being watched. For a while, he tried to shrug it off. Nothing moved or made a sound among the trees except the wind. But the feeling not only persisted, it grew stronger. The hairs on his arms stirred. His skin prickled as if it itched on the inside. He shifted his bow irritably to rub at his arms and told himself to stop letting fancies take him. There was nothing in the woods on his side of the road and Tam would have spoken if there had been anything on the other. He glanced over his shoulder and blinked. Not more than twenty spans back down the road, a cloaked figure on horseback followed them, horse and rider alike black, dull and ungleaming. It was more habit than anything else that kept him walking backward alongside the cart, even while he looked. The rider's cloak covered him to his boot tops, the cow tugged well forward so no part of him showed. Vaguely, Rand thought there was something odd about the horseman, but it was the shadowed opening of the hood that fascinated him. He could see only the vaguest outlines of a face, but he had the feeling he was looking right into the rider's eyes, and he could not look away. Queasiness settled in his stomach. There was only shadow to see in the hood, but he felt hatred as sharply as if he could see a snarling face. Hatred for everything that lived. Hatred for him most of all. For him above all things. Abruptly a stone caught his heel and he stumbled, breaking his eyes away from the dark horseman. His bow dropped to the road and only an outthrust hand grabbing Bella's harness saved him from falling flat on his back. With a startled snort, the mare stopped, twisting her head to see what had caught her. Tam frowned over Bella's back at him. Are you all right, lad? A rider, Rand said breathlessly. 
pulling himself up, right? A stranger following us. Where? The older man lifted his broad-bladed spear and peered back wearily. There, down the... Rand's words trailed off as he tried to point. The road behind was empty. Disbelieving, he stared into the forest on both sides of the road. Bare branch trees offering no hiding place, but there was not a glimmer of horse or horseman. He met his father's questioning gaze. He was there, a man in a black coat on a black horse. I wouldn't doubt your words, lot, but where has he gone? I don't, I don't know, but he was there. He snatched up the falling bow and arrow, hastily checked the fletching before re-knocking, and half true before letting the bowstring relax. There was nothing to aim at. He was. Tam shook his brick crystal head. If you say so, lot, come on then. A horse leaves footprints, even on this ground. He started toward the rear of the cart, his cloak whipping in the wind. If we find him, we'll know for a fact he was there. If not, well, these are days that make a man think he's seen things. Abruptly, Rand realized what had been odd about that horseman. Aside from his being there at all, the wind that beat at Tam and him has not so much as shifted a fold of that black coat. His mouth was suddenly dry. He must have imagined it. His father was right. This was a morning to prickle the man's imagination. But he did not believe it. Only, how did he tell his father that the man who had apparently vanished into air wore a cloak the wind did not touch? With a worried frown, he peered into the woods around them. It looked different than it ever had before. Almost since he was old enough to walk, he had run loose in the forest. The ponds and streams of the water wood beyond the last farms east of Eamon's Field were where he had learned to swim. He had explored into the sand hills, which many in the two rivers had said was bad luck. And once he had even gone to the very foot of the mountains of mist. Him and his closest friends, Matt Cawthon and Perry Navarra. He was a lot further afield than most people in Eamon's Field ever went. To them, a journey to the next village up to Watch Hill or down to Devon Rhine was a big event. Nowhere in all of that had he found a place that made him afraid. Today, though, the Westwood was not the place he remembered. A man who could disappear so suddenly could reappear just as suddenly. Maybe even right beside them. No, no, father, there's no need. When Tam stopped in surprise, Rand covered his flush by tugging at the hood of his cloak. You're probably right. No point looking for what isn't there. Not when we can use the time getting on to the village and out of the swing. I could do with a pipe, Tam said slowly, and a mug of ale where it's warm. Abruptly, he gave a broad grin, and I expect you're eager to see it we. Rand managed a weak smile. Of all things he might want to think about right then, the mayor's daughter was far down the list. He did not need any more confusion. For the past year, she had been making him increasingly jittery whenever they were together. Worse, she did not even seem to be aware of it. No, he certainly did not want to add a gween to his thoughts. He was hoping his father had not noticed he was afraid when Tam said, Remember the flame, lad, and the void. It was an odd thing Tam had taught him. Concentrate on a single flame and feed your passions into it. Fear, hate, anger, until your mind became empty. Become one with the void, Tam told him, and you could do anything. Nobody else in Emusfield talked that way. But Tam won the archery competition at bell time every year with his flame and his void. Rand thought he might have a chance at placing this year himself if he could manage to hold on to the void. For Tam to bring it up now meant that he had noticed, but he said nothing more about it. Tam clucked Bella into motion once more, and they resumed their journey, the older man striding along as if nothing untoward had happened, and nothing untoward could. Rand missed, wished he could imitate him. He tried forming the emptiness in his mind, 
but he kept slipping away in the images of the black cloak horseman. He wanted to believe that Tam was right, that the rider had just been his imagination. But he could remember that feeling of hatred too well. There had been someone, and that someone had meant him harm. He did not stop looking back until the high peak thatched roofs of Enos Field surrounded him. The village lay close onto the west wood, the forest gradually thinning until the last few trees stood actually among the stout frame houses. The land sloped gently down to the east, though not without patches of woods. Farms and hedge bordered fields and pastures quilted the land beyond the village, all the way to the waterwood and its tangle of streams and ponds. The land to the west was just as fertile, and the pastures were lush in most years, but only a handful of farms could be found in the westwood. Even those few dwindled to none miles short of the sand hills, not to mention the mountains of mist, which rose above the westwood treetops, distant but in plain sight from Enos Field. Some said the land was too rocky, as if there were not rocks everywhere in the two rivers, and others said it was hard luck land. A few muttered that there was no point getting any closer to the mountains than needs be. Whatever the reasons, only the hardiest men farmed the westwood. Small children and dogs dodged around the cart in whooping swarms once it passed the first row of houses. Bella plodded on patiently, ignoring the yelling youngsters who tumbled under her nose, playing tag and rolling hoops. In the last months, there had been little of play or laughter for the children, even when the weather had slackened enough to let children out. Fear of wolves kept them in. It seemed the approach of bell time had taught them how to play again. The festival had affected the adults as well. Broad shutters were thrown back, and in almost every house the good wife stood in a window, apron tied about her and long braided hair done up in a kerchief. Shaking sheets or hanging mattresses over the window sills. Whether or not leaves had appeared on the trees, no woman would let bell time come before her spring cleaning was done. In every yard, rugs hung from stretched lines, and children who had not been quick enough to run free in the streets instead vented their frustration on the carpets with wicker beaters. On roof after roof, the good men of the house clambered about, checking the thatch to see if the winter's damage meant calling on Sin Beauty, the thatcher. Several times Tim paused to engage one man or another in brief conversation. Since he and Rand had not been off the farm for weeks, everyone wanted to catch up on how things were out that way. Few Westwood men had been in. Tim spoke of damage from winter storms, each one worse than the one before, and stillborn lambs of brown fields where Crops should be sprouting and pastures greening, of ravens flocking in where songbirds had come in years before. Grim talk, with preparations for bell time, going on all around them, and much shaking of heads. It was the same on all sides. Most of the men rolled their shoulders and said, Well, well, survive the light, will it? Some grinned and added, And if the light doesn't, will it? Well, still survive. That was the way of most Two Rivers people. People who had to watch the hell beat their crops to the wolves take their lambs and start over. No matter how many years it happened, did not give up easily. Most of those who did were long since gone. Tam would not have stopped for Whit Conger if the man had not come out into the street so they had to haul or let Bella run over him. The Congers and the Coplins. The two families were so intermarried, no one really knew where one family let off and the other began. We're known from Watch Hill to Devon Ride and maybe as far as Terra Feather as complainers and troublemakers. I have to get this to Brand Elvira with, Tam said, nodding to the barrels in the cart. But the scrawny man held his ground with a sour expression on his face. He had been sprawled on his front steps, not up on his roof, though the thatch looked as if it badly needed Master Beale's attention. He never seemed ready to start over or to finish what he started the first time. Most of the Coplins and Congers were like that, those who were not worse. What are we going to do about Nine Eve, Althor? Conger demanded. 
We can't have a wisdom like that for Emus Field. Tam sighed heavily. It's not our place, Wet. The wisdom is women's business. Well, we'd better do something, Althor. She said we'd have a mild winter and a good harvest. Now you ask her what she hears on the wind and she just scowls at you and stomps off. If you asked her the way you usually do, Wit, Tam said patiently, you're lucky she didn't thump you with that stick she carries. Now, if you don't mind, this brandy. Not even Almir is just too young to be wisdom, Althor. If the women's circle won't do something, then the village council has to. What business of yours is the wisdom, Wit Conger? roared a woman's voice. Wit flinched as his wife marched out of the house. Daisy Conger was twice as wide as Wit, a hard faced woman without an ounce of fat on her. She glared at him with her fist on her hips. You try meddling in the women's circle business and see how you like eating your own cooking. Which you won't do in my kitchen and washing your own clothes and making your own bed, which won't be under my roof. But Daisy, Wit whined, I was just. If you'll pardon me, Daisy, Tam said, Wit. The lights shine on you both. He got Bella moving again, leading her around this grony fellow. Daisy was concentrating on her husband now, but any minute she could realize whom it was Wit had been talking to. That was why they had not accepted any of the invitations to stop for a bite to eat or something hot to drink. When they saw Tim, the good wives of Emonsfield went on point like hounds spotting a rabbit. There was not a one of them who did not know just a perfect wife for a widower with a good farm, even if it was in the West Wood. Rand stepped along just as quickly as Tam, perhaps even more so. He was sometimes cornered when Tam was not around, with no way to escape outside of rudeness. Herded onto a stool by the kitchen fire, he would be fed pastries or honey cakes or meat fives, and always the good wife's eyes weighed and measured him as nearly as any merchant scales and tapes while she told him that what he was eating was not nearly so good as her widowed sister's cooking or her next to eldest cousin's. Tam was certainly not getting any younger, she would say. It was good that he had loved his wife, so it boded well for the next woman in his life, but he had mourned long enough. Tam needed a good woman. It was a simple fact. She would say, or something very close, that a man just could not do without a woman to take care of him and keep him out of trouble. Worst of all were those who paused thoughtfully at about that point, then asked with elaborate casually ex exactly how old he was now. Like most Two Rivers folk, Rand had a strong, stubborn spirit. Outsiders sometimes said it was the prime trait of the people in the Two Rivers that they could give mules lessons and teach stones. The good wives were fine and kindly women for the most part, but he hated being pushed into anything, and they made him feel as if he were being prodded with sticks. So he walked fast and wished Tam would hurry Bella along. Soon the street opened onto the green, a broad expanse in the middle of the village, usually covered with thick grass. The green was this spring showed only a few fresh patches among the yellowish brown of dead grass and the black of bare earth. A double handful of geese wallowed about, beatily eyeing the ground, but not finding anything worth pecking, and someone had tethered a milk crow to crop the sparse grass. Toward the west end of the green, the wine spring itself gushed out of a low stone outcrop in a flow that never fell, a flow strong enough to knock a man down and sweet enough to justify his name a dozen times over. From the spring to the rapidly widening wine spring water ran swiftly off to the east. Willows dotting his banks all the way to Master Thane's mill and beyond. Until it split into dozens of streams in the swampy depths of the water one. Two low rail foot bridges crossed the clear stream of the green, and one bridge wider than the others and stout enough to bear wagons. The wagon bridge marked where the north road coming down from Terran Ferry and Watch Hill became the old road leading to Devon Ride. Outsiders sometimes found it funny that the road had one name to the north and another to the south. 
But that was the way it had always been, as far as anyone in Evansville knew. And that was that. It was a good enough reason for Two Rivers people. On the far side of the bridges, the mounds were already building for the Bellatine fires. Three careful stacks of logs of almost as big as houses. They had to be on clear dirt, of course, not on the green, even sparse as it was. What a festival did not take place around the fires would happen on the green. Near the wine spring, a score of older women sang softly as they erected the spring pole, shorn of its branches. The straight, slender trunk of a fir tree stood ten feet high even in the hole they had dug for it. A knot of girls too young to wear their hair braided sat cross-legged and watched enviously, occasionally singing snatches of the song the women sang. Tam clucked at Bella as if to make her speed her pace, though she ignored it and ran studiously kept his eyes from what the women were doing. In the morning, the men would pretend to be surprised to find the pole. Then, at noon, the unmarried women would dance the pole, entwining it with long colored ribbons while the unmarried men sang. No one knew when the custom began or why. It was another thing that was the way it had always been, but it was an excuse to sing and dance, and nobody in the two rivers needed much excuse for that. The whole day of bell time would be taken up with singing and dancing and feasting, with time out for foot races and contests and almost everything. Prizes would be given not only to an archery, but for the best with a sling and a quarterstaff. There would be contests at solving riddles and puzzles at the rope tug and lifting and tossing rates. Prizes for the best singer, the best dancer, and the best fiddle player, for the quickest to shear a sheep even the best at bowls and at darts. Bell time was supposed to come when spring had well and truly arrived, the first lambs born and the first crop up. Even with the coal hanging on, though, no one had any idea of putting it off. Everyone could use a little singing and dancing. And to top everything, if the rumors could be believed, a grand display of fireworks was planned for the green. If the first peddler of the year appeared in time, of course, that had been causing considerable talk. It was ten years since the last such display, and that was still talked about. The wine spring end stood at the east end of the green, hard beside the wagon bridge. The first floor of the inn was river rock, though the foundation was older stone, some said, came from the mountains. The whitewashed second story, where Brenda went out beer, the innkeeper and the mayor of Emisville, for the past 20 years, lived in the back with his wife and daughters, jutted out over the lower floor all the way around. Red roof tile, the only such roof in the village, glittered in the weak sunlight, and smoke drifted from three of the inn's dozen tall chimneys. At the south end of the inn, away from the stream, stretched the remains of a much larger stone foundation. Once part of the inn, or so it was said, a huge oak grew in the middle of it now, with a bowl thirty paces around and spreading branches as thick as a man. In the summer, Bran Alvear set tables and benches under those branches, shady with leaves then, where people could enjoy a cup in a cooling breeze while they talked or perhaps set out a board for a game of stones. Here we are, lad. Tam reached for Bella's harness, but she stopped in front of the inn before his hand touched the ladder. <laughs> Knows the way better than I do, he chuckled. As the last creak of the axle faded, Bran Alvira appeared from the inn, seeming as always a step too lightly for a man of his girth, nearly double that of anyone else in the village. A smile split his round face, which was topped by a sparse fringe of gray hair. The innkeeper was in his shirt sleeves despite the chill, with a spotless white apron wrapped around him, a silver medallion in the form of a set of balance scales hung on his chest. The medallion, along with the full-size set of scales used to weigh the coins of the merchants who came down from Bayerland for wool or tobacco, was a symbol of the mayor's office. Bran only wore for dealing with the merchants and for festival feast days and weddings. He had it on a day early now, but that night was winter night, the night before bell time, when everyone would visit back and forth almost a whole night, long exchanging small gifts, having a bite to eat and a touch to drink at every house. 
After the winter, Rand thought, he probably considers winter night an excuse enough not to wait until tomorrow. Damn, the mayor shouted as he hurried toward them. The light shine on me is good to see you at last. And you, Rand, how are you, my boy? Fine, Master Lear, Rand said, and you, sir? But Rand's attention was already back on town. I was almost beginning to think you wouldn't be bringing your brandy this year. You never waited so late before. I have no liking for leaving the farms these days, Rand, Tam replied. Not with the wolves the way they are, and the weather. Brand harumped. <laughs> I could wish somebody wanted to talk about something besides the weather. Everyone complains about it, and folk who should know better expect me to set it right. I've just spent 20 minutes explaining to Mr. Sal Donald that I can do nothing about the storks, though she expected me to do. He shook his head. An ill omen, a scratchy voice announced. No storks nexting on the rooftops of bell time? Sand view, as gnarled and dark as an old root, marched up to Tam and Bran and leaned on his walking staff, near as tall as he was and just as gnarled. He tried to fix both men at once with a beady eye. There's worse to come, you mark my words. Have you become a soothsayer then, interpreting omens? Tam asked dryly. Or do you listen to the wind like a wisdom? There's certainly enough of it. Some are originating not far from here. Mock if you will, said Mushroom. But it doesn't seem warm enough to crops to sprout soon. More than one root cellar will be coming up empty before there's a harvest. By next winter, there may not be nothing left alive in the two ears of wolves and ravens. If it is next winter at all, maybe it will still be this winter. Now that, what is that supposed to be? Bran said sharply. Tim gave them a shower look. I'm not much good to say about naive Almira. You know that. For one thing, she's too young to, no matter. The Wim Circle seems to object to the Wizard Council even talking about the business, though they interfere in ours whenever they want to, which is most of the time or so it seems to. Sin, Tim broke in. Is there a point to this? This is the point, Althor. Ask the wisdom when the winter will end, and she walks away. Maybe she doesn't want her to tell us or what she hears on the wind. Maybe what she hears is the winter won't end. Maybe it's just going to go on being winter until the wheel turns and the age ends. Where's the, There's your point. <laughs> Maybe sheep will fly, Tam snorted, and Bran threw up his hands. The light protect me from fools. You sitting on the village council. Sin, and now you're spreading that Copland talk. Well, you listen to me. We have enough problems without. A quick tug at Rand's sleeve and a voice pitched low for his ear alone distracted him from the older man's talk. Come on, Rand. While they're arguing, before they put you to work. Rand glanced down and had the grin. Matt Cawthon crouched beside the cart so Tam and Brand and Sin could not see him. His wiry body contorted like a stork trying to bend itself double. Matt's brown eyes twinkled with mischief as usual. Davin, I call a big old badger, all grouchy at being pulled out of its den. We're going to let it loose on the vegan green and watch the girls run. Rand's smile broadened. <laughs> it did not sound as much like fun to him as it would have a year or two back, but Matt never seemed to grow up. He took a quick look at his father as the men had their heads together, still all three talking at once. Then he lowered his own voice. I promise to unload them inside her. I can meet you later, though. Matt rolled his eyes skyward. Toting barrels? Burn me? I'd rather play stones with my baby sister. Well, I know better things than the badger. We have strangers in the two rivers. Last evening. For an instant, Rand stopped breathing. A man on horseback? He asked intently. A man in a black cloak? On a black horse? And his cloak doesn't move in the wind? Matt swallowed his grin, and his voice dropped to an even hoarser whisper. You saw him, too? I thought I was the only one. Don't laugh, Rand. 
but he scared me. I'm not laughing. He scared me too. I could swear he hated me and he wanted to kill me. Rand shivered. Until that day, he had never thought of anyone wanting to kill him, really wanting to kill him. That sort of thing just did not happen in the two rivers. A fist fight, maybe, or a wrestling match, but not killing. I don't know about hating Rand, but he was scary enough anyway. All he did was sit on his horse looking at me just outside the village. But I've never been so frightened in my life. Well, I looked away just for a moment. It wasn't easy, my hand. Then when I looked back, he'd finished. Blood and ashes. Three days has been, I can hardly stop thinking about him. I keep looking over my shoulder. Matt attempted to laugh, but came out of the croak. <laughs> Funny how being scared takes you. You think strange things. I actually thought, just for a minute, mine, it might be the dark one. He tried another laugh, but no sound came out at all this time. Rand took a deep breath, as much to remind himself as for any other reason, he said by rope, the dark one and all the forsaken are bound in shield move, beyond the great plight, bound by the creator at the moment of creation, bound until the end of time. The hand of the creator shelters the world, and the light shines on us all. <sighs> he drew another deep breath and went on, besides, if he was free, what would the shepherd of the night be doing in two rivers watching farm boys? I don't know, but I do know that rider was evil. Don't laugh. I'll take oath on it. Maybe it was the dragon. You're just full of cheerful thoughts, aren't you? Rand muttered. You sound worse than sin. My mother always said the forsaken would come for me if I didn't mend my ways. If I ever saw anybody look like Ishmael or Agenor, it was him. Everybody's mother scared them with the forsaken, Rand said dryly. The most grow out of it. Why not the shadow man while you're about it? Matt glared at him. I haven't been so scared since. No, I've never been that scared. And I don't mind admitting it. Me either. My father thinks I was jumping in shadows under the trees. Matt nodded glumly and leaned back against the cartwheel. So does my dad. I don't dive and eat them down tree. They've been watching like hawks ever since, but they haven't seen anything. Now, Elam thinks I was trying to trick him. Dad thinks he's down from Terran Ferry, a sheep stealer or a chicken thief. A chicken thief! He laughs into a front of silence. It's probably all foolishness anyway, Rand said finally. Maybe he is just a sheep stealer. He tried to picture it, but it was like picturing a wolf taking the cat's place in front of mouse hole. Well, I didn't like the way he looked at me, and neither did you, not if he, how you jumped at me as any guy. We ought to tell someone. We already have, Matt, both of us, and we weren't believed. Can you imagine trying to convince Master Albeer about this fellow without him seeing him? He sent us off to Nani to see if we were sick. There are two of us now. Nobody could believe we both imagined it. Rand rubbed the top of his head bristling, wondering what to say. Matt was something of a byword around the village. Few people had escaped his pranks. Now his name came up whenever a wash line dropped the laundry in the dirt or a loose saddle girth deposited a farmer in the road. Matt did not even have to be anywhere around. His support might be worse than none. After a moment, Rand said, Your father would believe you put me up to it. And mine, he looked over at the cart to where Tam and Bran and Sin had been talking and found himself staring his father in the eyes. The mayor was still lecturing Sin, who took it now in sullen silence. Good morning, Matron, Tam said brightly, hefting one of his brandy cats up onto the side of the cart. I see if you come to help Bran a little decider. Good lad. Matt leaped to his feet at the first word and began backing away. Good morning to you, Master Althor, and to you, Master Alvir, and Master Bew. Uh, may the light shine on you. My dad sent me the... No doubt he did, Tam said. And no doubt, since you're a lad who does his chores right off, you've finished the task already. Well, the quicker you lads get the cider in the Master Alvir's cell, the quicker you can see the gleaming. Gleaming! Matt exclaimed. 
stopping dead in his footsteps at the same instant that Ran asked, when will he get here? Ran could remember only two claiming coming to tell two rivers in his whole life. And for one of those, he had been young enough to sit on Tam's shoulders to watch, to have one there actually during bell times with his harp and his flute and his stories and all, even as Phil would still be talking about this festival ten years off, even if there were not any fireworks. Foolishness, Sin grumbled, but fell silent at a look from Bran that had all the way of the mayor's office in it. Tam leaned against the side of the cart, using the brandy cast as a prop for his arm. Yes, a gleeman, and already here. According to Master Alvira, he's in the room the inn right now. Arrived in the dead of night, he did. The innkeeper shook his head in disapproval, pounded on the door till he woke the whole family. If not for festival, I'd told him to stable his own horse and sleep in the stall with it, gleeman or not. Imagine coming in the dark like that. Rand stared wonderingly. No one traveled beyond the village by night. Not these days, certainly not alone. The Thatcher grumbled under his breath again, too low this time for Rand to understand more than a word or two. Mad me, unnatural. He doesn't wear a black cloak, does he? Matt asked suddenly. Rand's belly shook with a chuckle. <laughs> black? <laughs> His cloak is like every other Gleeman's cloak I've ever seen. More patches than cloak and more colors than you can think of. Rand startled himself by laughing out loud, a laugh of pure relief. The menacing black clad rider as a Gleeman was a ridiculous notion, but he clapped a hand over his mouth in embarrassment. You see, Tim, Bran said, there's been little enough laughter in this village since winter came. Not even the Gleeman's cloak brings a laugh. That alone is worth the expense of bringing him down from burial. Say what you will. Sin spoke up suddenly. I still say it's a foolish waste of money, and those fireworks you all insisted on sending off for. So there are fireworks, Matt said, but Sin went right on. They should have been here a month ago with the first peddler of the year, but there hasn't been a peddler, has there? If he doesn't come by tomorrow, what are we going to do with him? Hold another festival just to set him off? That's if he even brings him, of course. Sin, Tim sighed. You have as much trust as a tearing fairy man. Where is he then? You tell me that, Al Thor. Why didn't you tell us, Matt demanded in an aggrieved voice. The whole village would have had as much fun with the waiting as with the gleaming. Or almost anyway, you can see how everybody's been over just a rumor of fireworks. I can see, Bram replied with a sidelong look at that statue. And if I knew for sure how that rumor started, if I thought, for instance that somebody had been complaining about how much things cost where people could hear him when the things are supposed to be secret. Sin cleared his throat. <clears throat> My bones are too old for this wind. If you don't mind, I'll just see if Mr. Thumbier won't fix me some more wine to take the chill out. Mayor, Elthor, he was headed for the inn before he finished. And as the door swung shut behind him, Bran sighed. Sometimes I think Nani is right about. Well, that's not important now. You young fellows think for a minute. Everyone's excited about the fireworks, true, and that's only and a rumor. Think how they'll be if the peddler doesn't get here in time after all this anticipating. And with the weather the way it is, who knows when he will come. They'd be 50 times as excited about a gleamer and feel 50 times as bad if he didn't come, Rand said slowly. Even bell time might not do for much for people's spirits after that. You have a head on your shoulders when you choose to it. Use it, Bran said. He'll follow you on the village council one day, Tam. Mark my words. He couldn't do much worse right now than someone I could name. None of this in unloading the cart, Tam said briskly, handing the first cast of brandy to the mare. I want a warm fire and my pipe and a mug of your good ale. He hoisted the second brandy cast onto his shoulder. I'm sure Rand will thank you for your help, Matron. Remember, the sooner the cider is in the cellar. As Tam and Bran disappeared into the inn, Rand looked at his friend. He don't have to help. Dad won't keep that badge long. Oh, why not? Matt said resignedly. Like your dad said, the quicker is in the cellar. Picking up one of the castle cider in both arms, he hurried toward the inn in a half shot. 
Maybe a green is around. <laughs> Watch it, you stare at it like a pole like socks will be as good as a badger any day. Rand paused in the act of putting his bow and quiver in the back of the cart. He really had managed to put a green out of his mind. That was unusual in itself. But she would likely be around the end somewhere. There was not much chance he could avoid her. Of course, it had been weeks since he saw her last. Well, Matt called from the front end. I didn't say I would do it by myself. You aren't on village council yet. With a start, Rand took up a cast and followed. Perhaps she would not be there after all. Oddly, that possibility did not make him feel any better. I'd like to thank you for bearing with me and for listening to this first chapter of The Wheel of Time, Eye of the World, An Empty Road. Please comment and let me know how I did. And also, if you would like and share and subscribe, it would be greatly appreciated. This is Tor saying, until next time, May the Creator shelter us and keep us safe to docking.